right, guys, so now we're going to talk about stress. And who knows stress better than a nursing student, right? Um, before we um, really dive into stress, you have to understand homeostasis, right? Our body wants to be in this state of balance. That's homeostasis. It keeps us in equilibrium. Um, it's kind of like a set point. Like you've got a set point as far as weight is concerned. One homeostatic mechanism in our body is the RAS system, R-A-A-S, um, and this is the um, renin-angiotensin system. Um, so our kidneys, our kidneys like to have a certain kind of pressure going to them because we need a certain kind of pressure, yes, blood pressure, to push hard enough to get um, filtrate through the um, glomerular apparatus, right? We've got that glomerulus, that's where the filtrate is filtering through. If we don't have enough pressure, that doesn't work right. So our kidneys are great at knowing when we don't have enough pressure. And some of it is our heart, some of it though is the amount of fluid in our body um, that can either make or break that pressure, right? And so if we don't have enough pressure going there, like say our fluid is low, um, our kidneys panic and they send off this signal. And this sig signal is called renin. And so the, the kidneys go whoop, whoop, send off the renin, and the renin goes out and it changes this angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, okay? That's because our kidneys know that we've been popped out of equilibrium. We are no longer in homeostasis. And so we go into allostasis, a process of restoring homeostasis in response to a stressor. We go into this process of going back to where we should be, where we were at homeostasis. So the kidneys panic because they don't have enough uh, pressure coming at them, whoop, whoop, they send out the renin, the renin goes and it turns that angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. The lungs are actually taking part in this too and they send out a little bit of ACE and the ACE converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a little bit of a vasoconstrictor, right? Like, like boa constrictor, it is clamping down on the uh, vasculature so those little arterioles, it's clamping down on them a little bit. And then um, a, can more cascades of sequence occur, um, and we eventually get aldosterone and um, vasopressin, or ADH, antidiuretic hormone. We get these also uh, expressed. Um, and so when this is going on, with this with the aldosterone sent out in the body, um, we get sodium and water retention, okay? With the antidiuretic hormone, or vasopressin, we get vasoconstriction and water retention. So aldosterone is the one that owns the sodium. So that one actually holds back sodium and it holds back the water. The vasopressin or the antidiuretic hormone, since it has the word diuretic in it, it's antidiuretic, so it does the opposite of a diuretic, and it holds on to water. You notice it does not hold on to sodium. But it does have a little bit of a, actually a lot of it, of a vasoconstriction property, where <coughs> now those boa constrictor muscles out at the, um, out at the periphery um, where um, the arterioles are, now they're constricting a little bit, and now um, that allows for the blood pressure to go up. Excuse me. <sighs> and that water and that sodium retention overall allow for the blood pressure to also go up because now we're holding on to fluid. Allostasis is that process of restoring homeostasis in response to a stressor. Um, it is the ability to successfully adapt to challenges. It is dynamic. Dynamic means that it's constantly changing, right? So then we have stress. So um, stress is anything like physical, chemical, or emotional factors that results in the tension of the body or the mind. It can be real or perceived. Perception is really the most important um, to that. Chronic stress 
um, can cause hypertension, high blood sugar, and depression. Just know that all of those things can happen from chronic stress. Um, so stressors, agents that produce stress, they can endanger homeostasis, they can be positive or negative. Now, risk factors. Um, risk factors are conditions or situations that do increase the likelihood of encountering that stressor. Seeley's adapt general adaptation syndrome should have an E at the end of syndrome. Um, so we've got the alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And I like to do, we've got exhaustion or adaptation. Um, alarm and resistance. Um, and then exhaustion. Um, resistance does have some adaptation involved in it. Um, but at any rate, what you need to remember is that Seeley's general adaptation system syndrome involves alarm resistance and exhaustion. In the alarm phase, we can talk about the fight or flight response. It's the result of stress. Uh, we can talk about the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, glucocorticoids are released. Catecholamines are released. Um, in that stress response, this sympathetic side is um, what kicks in. Our pupils get big. Um, so the sympathetic side is designed to kick in, it's part of our nervous system um, where this neurochemical process kicks in because back in the day we were being chased by bears, right? So our pupils get big. Um, our salivary glands, they're not gonna be running because we don't need our GI tract to be working right now. We need to get away from the bear. We do not need to have anything that is involved with eating or we're gonna get eaten. Um, the heart, the heartbeat accelerates, um, the bronchi dilate, and um, the blood pressure actually goes up a bit. Uh, digestion is inhibited. Um, because digestion is inhibited, we still have this glucose need, so our liver has stores in it, and um, our liver um, is stimulated to release glucose. So. The kidneys uh, stimulate epinephrine and norepinephrine release, which are actually what, what are causing a lot of these things in our body to occur. Our intestines inhibit peristalsis and secretion. And then it says here relaxes bladder, but the result is actually no pee. So no pee and no poop while we're getting chased by a bear. If we stop to use the restroom, the bear is going to eat us. Um, we can talk about the resistance or adaptation phase. So this is the activity of part of the neuroendocrine system that is helping to return the body back to homeostasis. It's an allostatic state. Um, we can talk about this um, after that sympathetic has been working. We've run from the bear. Now we're done running from the bear. Um, the parasympathetic kicks in to bring us back to normal so that we're not always in this um, acute state over here. The parasympathetic will bring us back to normal. It'll allow our, our pupils to constrict then again and focus in on the closer things, not, not so big as they were when we were getting chased by the bear. Um, then the, it does stimulate the salivary clan, glands, slows the heartbeat, constricts the bronchi, stimulates digestion, stimulates bile release um, to help with the digestion, right? and then stimulates peristalsis and secretion, and then it allows that bladder to contract. So now we get pee, now we get poop, all right? Adaptation. Um, I, adaptation is a biopsychosocial uh, response um, to altered circumstances. It's the way the body copes. Exhaustion, the body can no longer return to homeostasis. So if this occurs, um, a lot of times it's because of allostatic overload, not overlead, overload. Um, wear and tear may ensue. Um, habituation can happen. Um, and a type of habituation is called desensitization. Um, let's talk about those just a little bit here. So habituation, there's a diminished um, physical or emotional response after repeated exposure. So if you live in an area that's right next to like 
like we live right next to an area where um, people are deer hunting. So the first time you hear that in the year, um, it scares you a little bit. And then over the, over the course of deer hunting season, um, you know the times of day that they're doing it. It's less and less scary each time. That's habituation. Desensitization is deliberate um, habituation. Again, guys, totally embarrassed with all these uh, typos in here. Um, therapy um, with deliberate habituation, maybe somebody's really scared of elevators. So the first hundred times they ride in the elevator, we use biofeedback or visualization or meditation or something like that. And then after they've done it, um, after some time, they're fine. Endorphins. Endorphins are things um, that can be released in our body. Um, so um, you need to know about endorphins basically because, um, so like when somebody's giving birth uh, or if somebody has is running a marathon, after a certain amount of time running the marathon, um, these endorphins will be released. Um, and when these endorphins are released, then people don't, don't feel the pain as much, right? And so these are actually things that activate naturally these body, the body's opioid receptors, and they do cause um, analgesic effects. Um, so enkephalins are closely related. Um, they are peptides. They're very similar to endorphins. Um, we're not going to get too far into them. Um, glucocorticoids are also released um, during a stress response. Um, it doesn't always have to be a sympathetic response. Um, a lot of times um, in response to stress, if somebody's sick, if somebody's septic, you'll see their sugar is up because the glucocorticoids have been sent out. Um, so corticosteroid hormones get sent out in response to stressors because they have been used to over the years they've been used to when you're getting chased by a bear helping to start that cascade to get the um, glucose a little higher in the system um, suppressing the immune system a little bit because inflammation um, does does happen and, and glucocorticoids help kind of bring down that inflammation um, these are released by the adrenal cortex during stress and guys that's stress in a nutshell i'm so glad you joined me I'll see you later.